it says that a bunch of people looking at a chart and saying, well, looks like we made the wrong choice. We laid off too many people. The parking lot and the organization was the biggest revenue Well, it's, this is in a lighter way. But I'm trying to make a point here that data-driven decision-making is what today's world is about. It's about empirical data. It's about understanding empirical data. It's about assimilating data from multiple sources. I mean, just from the time we started, all our cell phones have probably generated 200 megabytes of data. Every little GPS location, every little network, every banking transaction that we're doing. Everything is, everything is just generating lots and lots of data. Big data industry snapshot, it's supposed to be a 50 billion plus industry in less than five years. And this is just about the scratching the surface. Because as a civilization, as a set of people, based on all the discussions that we have since morning, every little piece is going to generate more and more data. Right? And what do we do with this kind of data? And I will switch over to an example. This is extremely important to our Indian partners. Right? So all of us know about the terrible incident that happened in Delhi with the that gruesome rape that happened. So after that, the Supreme Court has gone out and said that every vehicle that is transporting a, a citizen of the country needs to be GPS tagged. So now in, in NCR, every vehicle, there are about one lakh auto insurance, taxis, and buses. Every 10 seconds, they are sending out information about their latitude longitude, their speed, and their engine parameter, and the meter is down. So first off, just imagine the amount, this is about a few terabytes of data coming into the enterprise every day. And it just keeps building, it just keeps building. Now what we have done is we put a Hadoop front end to it, a Hadoop system to face it. We are storing that information. And now we are able to predict know, which roads are going to get traffic, which roads are going to get jammed. We are able to predict, we are able to tell an ambulance go from point A to point B. And these are all things that we have done ourselves, right? As a big data predictive analytics. We are able, you get out of home, you have iPhone applications, Android applications. Let's say when you get out of home in, uh, in, in Gurgaon and you have to go to Nehru Place, you have five different ways of going. You have metro, you have bus, you have uh, shared, you have your own car. Which is the most cost effective and time effective way of going? That is, to me, and I think some, some of the distinguished panelists have already said this, I will go ahead and repeat it, technology is the enabler. It's the solutions that come out of that which is very, very important. And big data, predictive analytics, is solving problems for us. It's, it's helping me, for example, as, an, as a company, we are going out and predicting medical cost one year out. Right? We are saying, who's going to buy what? These are some of the tougher problems that we are solving using big data and predictive analytics. I'm sorry this is not visible because as soon as I'm going into presentation mode, it's all, it's all getting all wired up. We are going to get to 35 zettabytes of data. For, the, for people who are mathematically inclined, one zettabyte is 10 raised to 29. So one followed by 29. This is, the, this is the type of volume of data that we are generating as a civilization. Some of the things that's happening which is very, very interesting to me. The number of products ordered per second on Amazon is about 17 products being bought every second. The number of weeks per day is 50 million. Now, all of this contains knowledge. All of this contains hidden knowledge. And a lot of this data is getting unstructured. Right? Gone are those days when everything was in databases, everything was in enterprise systems. Now we have moved out and everything is unstructured. People are expressing what right? When I was growing up, if I wrote a little poem, to get that published anywhere was a big deal, right? Today everybody will publish it. You go and start blogging. You go and start expressing their opinion. Everybody has a mechanism to express their opinion. This is another way of looking at what is happening in an internet minute, right? And I'm going to read out some of these things for you. 47,000 app downloads, 20 million Facebook pages.
page views, two million plus search queries. So future growth is staggering on the data. And the amount of data that we're generating and the value that is stacked into this data is just immense. I think I'm going to skip a lot of these things because this, the, all these things have already been done. What are the four discrete characteristics of big data? Initially, there were three. Now we have a lot more. I'm going to jump to an example in the case of a solar power cell company that we are we have propositioned and we have given up, given them solutions. So they, they have gone out in, in the state of Rajasthan and deep in Rajasthan they put these solar cells. And the business model was perfect because it was generating a lot of power, the state was buying it, etc. Suddenly, in about a year, maintenance issues start coming. Now to fix one solar power cell, you have to send somebody in a jeep, 20 miles, 20 kilometer thing, or 500 pixels in very mind. That was a really down and down. We went diagonally. Again, network, RFID devices, right? Start sending the health parameters every five seconds on GPS. So what Suman says, right? Network has is the backbone of all it. Now what you can do is through predictive analytics, you can identify, you can preempt which solar cell is going to break down. And now in one swipe, you fix some, you do preventive maintenance on the other. So just the applications of data-driven decision making is what is completely mind-boggling to us to an emerging enterprise like this. Right? We are seeing the impact of this in healthcare, in retail. We are doing couponing, we are doing uh, prediction of uh, safety violations, compliance violations. I mean, name it, name the problem, and analytics is there to attempt to solve. Too much, okay, sorry. So I'm just going to jump into, and I, I believe that. I wanted to share my experience as to who data scientists are, what are the skill sets needed, and why I believe that as a as an emerging enterprise, I am perfectly positioned in capital right? We need people who are math and science. Who are, I, so my first question to anybody who wants to join my organization, do you love math? If the answer is a yes, you can without it. If you do not like numbers, not a trick for us. So, math and science, we, are, we love math and science. We have so many institutes, and Charity is going to talk about one. We have an IIT, we have an ISI. I have a data sciences team right here in Salt Lake, which beats, competes and beats the best in the world. Right? We have almost half the class of IIT that have full computer science department in our office. We have been hired from ISI. And there is a shortage of 1.4 million data scientists by the year 2007. That is the protection. To your question about 2.6 to 1.5, and a data scientist, and for, for people from the trade, a data scientist typically builds at 10 times the job. Right? So to me, and I'm sharing this with everybody in this room. Mission 2.6 to 15 analytics is the answer. And we are right here. We are right in the heart of analytics. I, whenever I go back to the US to talk to my customers, I call the capital plan investment or the analytics alley. This is definitely the analytics alley. This is where we will read analytics, we will read the work, we will read innovation on data science, which will take everything away. And, and yes, we have, as, as a location, we might have lost out on the IT the mobility uh, revolution, the big data revolution, the predictive analytics revolution. We are right there. We are the leaders. We just need to create an ecosystem right here where we are, which breeds such talent, which makes them from statisticians to data scientists who understand business and go out to the rest of the world and say, look, and flaunt them. That's precisely what Azuba as an organization does, and we are making, we are doing an excellent job at it, and we are extremely happy in this room. Uh,
from the Bengal Chamber of Commerce, and I'm a past chairman of the IT subcommittee, I would suggest that we take a look at this and bring up these issues as to if we are to move from 2.6% to 15%, whether these two areas constitute a particular market segment that hitherto the government or the community in West Bengal has not tapped into, because certainly they contribute a significant chunk of the revenues on a national basis. In particular, I would love to see a product company have an R&D center in Sector 5, and as we all know, there have been significant investments made by these companies across various centers in India. So these are the two market segments that we could tap into. The next question then arises that beyond the product center and the shared services center or the captive center, what are some of the natural areas that perhaps West Bengal can take a look at to understand that where would some of this development come in? One of the things that I believe is that if you take a look, West Bengal does not have or Calcutta does not have, it is not the headquarters of any premier development center. What do I mean by that? There are, of course, there are centers by TCS, there are centers by CTS and others and Wipro, but this is not the leading center that they have in India. It's, of course, an excellent number two or the second uh, center, maybe because the state started out late. But apart from the uh, establishments that PricewaterhouseCoopers had made many years ago, I'm not aware of a leading center being set up first in Kolkata. I may be wrong, but that is my impression. The other thing is that there is only so much that you can do out of these service delivery centers which are anyway primarily getting more and more into application maintenance services and therefore the thought arises that whether we need to take a look at some of the niche areas that Rajiv talked about starting out with analytics which can provide the needed revenue from the state and the center perspective. Rajiv already talked about analytics, I'm not going to you know, further talk upon that but evidently the qualities and the skills that are needed for analytics are very evident in this area and recognize that we sometimes overlook the fact that this is the only major city which has an ISI, an IIT and an IIM in its near vicinity. No other city has that. If you think about it, no other metro in India has that combination of both, of all the three uh, major institutes. So analytics is one. Uh, if you take a look, HSBC has a captive center which does risk analytics in Salt Lake just outside sector 5. There is ICRA, which does similar work, and there is Genpa. But just like Rajiv has set up his company, we would like to see companies like Mu Sigma and the others come in in a very large way in Kolkata. Mu Sigma is one of the poster childs of analytics in India, which has its centers in Bangalore, and perhaps take a look at what can be done in that area. The second area that I want to talk about is the entire area of digital, which has two major components to it, and as I speak, I believe that you will realize where the advantage of Kolkata lies. If you take a look at the investments that Deloitte has made in digital, it is primarily around two skill sets. The first is, as uh, Kasturi was mentioning in a previous session, the entire concept of user interface or user interaction is rapidly changing. It's no longer the, it's no longer the laptop screen or the computer screen, it is a question of user interfaces getting embedded not just in mobility but also in various digital devices which you are going to use on a day in and day out perspective. The thought therefore is that in order to do this it calls for certain very specific skills in user interfaces and at least in Deloitte 50% of the team comes from an artistic background. They are people who are there from an advertising perspective, they are people who are there from an arts perspective who actually help you to understand how you can increase the stickiness of your website, what attracts people to come back to your website and do transactions, how do you make it intuitively appealing. You know, I don't think anyone painted, painted the swipe from Apple, but if you think of it, it's something that happens intuitively. So the thought is that, is there a play for West Bengal and Calcutta in this new area of user design? or user-driven design that is becoming increasingly important in the commercial applications that are getting laid out and whether there can be centers of excellence which are structured around that, which bring in new skills into the IT community beyond the traditional IT skills and also help the state grow in revenue. The third point that I want to uh, focus on as an example of digital is the entire area of wearables. 
I know that at least there is one company in Sector 5 which is taking a very close look at wearables and trying to understand how wearables can play out in this entire market. Again, wearables can be something as simple as a pedometer, which measures the number of steps that you're taking. And you can take uh, the entire area of wearables and link it into big data or analytics. If you take a look at a site which was called quantifiedself.com and is now called connectedself.com, which actually does a digital representation of yourself in terms of your medical status, in terms of your exercise, in terms of where you stand from an overall a personal digital representation of yourself, your activities and your operations. These would be some of the areas which lend themselves very naturally into the entire uh, focus area of what the state and the center can perhaps do. Finally, I want to talk about two interesting things that I have at least seen in social media. Uh, we recently published uh, a study that we do with MIT Sloan School for the past three years and the heading of this year's uh, study is social business beyond marketing and I want to talk about two very operational initiatives that I at least have seen which is heavily advertised in Facebook and I at least for one of them have not seen this initiative outside of Facebook in Kolkata. I'm sure if I ask for a show of hands there will be many people who use the services of salt and soap in Calcutta. Uh, anyone has used salt and soap? Uh, I am not a shareholder, I have no ownership pattern, uh, let me just be very clear on that, I have no interest in promoting this company. But Salt and Soap is an online grocery that has started in Kolkata and I have only seen advertisements on Facebook and nothing else. And I think that is something which is extremely interesting, it talks about a very new way of doing business. The third thing that I'm going to talk about is something which has come out in the papers also, an institution called Tribeca, which is actually giving you healthcare in your home and targeting the large non-resident Bengali community whose parents might be living here. What are the two patterns or trends that we see in here? One is the digital world, online selling, online retailing which will give rise to enormous opportunities in digital around analytics and therefore the play for the state and the center. The second is also even more interesting, it's a question of intermediation. We have always talked about technology being a disintermediary, taking away the business from travel agents and so on. This is an example of technology-led intermediation where care to old parents through digital hospital technologies are being given and can be remotely observed through social media like Facebook. These would be some of the trends that we need to exploit. So to sum up, two areas. One is definitely the skills that we have in mathematics and statistics. Uh, you know, if you take a look at Facebook and if you take a look at some of the sites where West Bengal dominates, it's probably an example of cloud because it seems to be more arguments on demand than anything else. But apart from that, if you take a look at it, you know, the skills in mathematics and statistics which lead itself very well into analytics. The second area are proficiency in arts which leads itself very well into the user driven design experience and the user interfaces that are going to dominate the new world. And the third area that I want to highlight is that if we are going to take a look at China as Shumit was mentioning in the speech, you know, 620 billion of investment. And if you take a look at Indian companies investing largely in China and in Southeast Asia and in the entire, you know, sort of the Asia-Pac region, we have universities like Vishwabharati who started out the first school for Chinese languages and Japanese languages in the country. There are perhaps synergies that can be exploited between the IT sector and some of these niche language sectors because I believe that if we have to grow, it has to be focusing on these niche areas. Whatever we have done for the technologies of the past will definitely be there as cash cows. But if you are taking a look at much faster growth, these would be some of the opportunities that we should take a look at. And finally, one point, um, and this is something that I remember making in a Bengal Chamber of Commerce presentation at least six years ago, is that let us start thinking beyond India. When we take a look and benchmark ourselves against Bangalore, Pune, Gurgaon, whatever, it's a zero-sum game. At the end of the day, it is a part of what India delivers. If we have to benchmark, let us benchmark against Shenzhen, let us benchmark against Johannesburg, let us benchmark against Warsaw. 
If we do that, then maybe 2.6 can become 150. If we limit ourselves to 15, then we are playing a zero-sum game within India. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rajeshri Singh Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard him. In addition to endorsing the analytics that Mr. Rajiv Pratap has said, Mr. Rajeshri Singh with his razor sharp mind has brought out some of the very interesting areas like a headquarter, Calcutta needs the headquarter of one of the biggies or few biggies. It needs R&D, it also needs you know, a shared services center and some of the niche areas that he has spoken about the languages and he has given example of uh, uh, Chinese and uh, Japanese studies that Tagore started much earlier possibly than anybody else in India. And last but not the least, his target setting was, I really liked his target setting. Set your target something higher, much higher than Gurgaon, Bangalore and Pune. Thank you Mr. Rajesh Chengupta. I am also doing part of the, uh, now I will uh, call for the other sub part of the other session that is human resource. Four decades back, I was an officer's cadet in the Indian Military Academy in Dehradun. The first HR and man management class, the first lecture, the first line I always have quoted at many places, that there, the first sentence told in the man management class, man behind the gun is more important than the gun. And that is true for all the business, everywhere, be it IT, be it non-IT, be it government, be it military, be it civil services, everywhere. We have got to distinguish panelists who will speak about the HR potency of West Bengal and what do they think because in the growth that the growth engine that we are talking we have spoken about our share that in Calcutta itself about 100,000 people are working in this sector. NASCOM data last year said that one third of the IT population they belong to uh, the state, one third of IT population in India they belong to the state. Now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Suresh about his views, how does he, what does he think about this HR potential of West Bengal and Mr. Rajeshri Sengupta categorically has emphasized, has emphatically stated that this is the only metro where IIT, IIM and ISI, all three are located. In addition, we also have some of the best universities, colleges and Jadavpur and Shippur. There are very old technological institutions and institutes like presidency.